Before turning to violence, like the 1980s African National Congress did, anti-apartheid South Africans opposed the unjust treatment and laws distinguishing non-white South Africans from the white South Africans through peaceful protests. While the less than okay lifestyle of black South Africans was nothing new, the rigid apartheid laws imposed by the Nationalist Party was segregation on steroids. One of the major anti-apartheid movement leaders that held true to peaceful opposition was Ruth First, journalist, scholar, and freedom fighter. Ruth Heloise First was born on May 4, 1925 in Johannesburg, South Africa, to Julius First and Matilda Leviton, both Jewish immigrants from Latvia and members of the Communist Party. From 1936 to 1941, Ruth attended the Jewish Government School and Jep Girls High School, where she continued to develop her already exemplary reading and writing skills. Much of what she learned about government and the Communist Party, however, came from her mother. Her mother was very determined to make sure Ruth was interested and educated in all things politics. In 1941, Ruth attended Witzwaterzrin University in Johannesburg in pursuit of a social science degree. Ruth was the first member of her family to attend college. While at university, Ruth became very involved in youth-led political groups, such as the Federation of Progressive Students, which she and a friend helped found, and the Young Communist League. After completing her final exams at WITS, Ruth went on a life-changing trip to the inaugural World Federation of Democratic Youth Conference in London. From London, she went on to Prague for the International Union of Students Conference, and on to Hungary, Yugoslavia, Italy, and France, where she would meet partisan leaders that would change her life. After a summer of travel and experience, Ruth cracked down and got a job at the Johannesburg City Council, where she was assigned to the research division. She found her work dull and disgustingly unimportant, considering all of the change happening around South Africa. After only a few months of working at the city council, Ruth was ready to go out and get involved. In Ruth's book, 117 Days, she recounts the exact point in which she chose to take a stand against the evilness of apartheid. When the African miner strike of 1946 broke out and it was dealt with by the Smuts government as though it was red insurrection and not a claim by poverty-stricken migrant workers for a minimum wage of 10 shillings a day, I asked for an interview with the council director and told him that I wanted to leave the department. Then he asked, have you another job? A political job, I said. In 1947, Ruth landed a job as the Johannesburg editor for the weekly newspaper, The Guardian. Here, Ruth was able to become an active member of the anti-apartheid movement and write articles about issues that she thought needed to be heard. The actual title, Apartheid, however, didn't originate until 1948. In 1948, the quality of life for non-white South Africans went from bad to worse, with the election of the Nationalist Party. Despite white South Africans making up only 20% of the population, because they were the only race eligible to vote, the very conservative Nationalist Party won. The swift and iron fist of apartheid came down on South Africa like a lethal disease, leaving people like Ruth to join with like-minded folks to stop its spread and worsening. In 1949, after about two years of knowing each other, Ruth married fellow communist Joe Slova, who had returned from serving in the Springbok Legion during World War II. While they were both deeply involved in the resistance and anti-apartheid movements, the two took different approaches to seeking change. Joe preferred militant action, while Ruth preferred verbal action. The 1950s kept Ruth extremely busy. As a sign of appreciation for her intense involvement in rousting the Nationalist Party from office, she was invited to visit the Soviet Union in 1951. By 1953, she was a mother of two girls, Robin and Sean, as well as a full-time journalist and executive for multiple groups, including the South African Congress of Democrats and the South African Peace Council. In 1954, Ruth was again given a trip, but this time to China. While her travels helped her envision a communist future for South Africa, it also kept her from her family and ultimately got her banned from attending public events by the government. 
It did allow her to spend more time writing, especially since she was elected to help draft the Freedom Charter. The year 1956 brought both triumph and challenge for Ruth. The National Women's Day March took place on August 9th. Ruth, a strong and vital member of the anti-apartheid movement, was able to see that, like her, many other women were ready to take a stand against apartheid. This march involved over 20,000 women and was in protest against the unjust passbook laws that controlled when and where black South Africans could and couldn't be. And even though women like Ruth First are hardly ever talked about, the thousands of other women that participated in the marches, protests, and boycotts were very important to the eventual abolition of apartheid as well. A turning point for the anti-apartheid movement came on March 21, 1960, when 69 unarmed black protesters were shot and 180 others were wounded while at a protest in Sharpeville, South Africa. While the massacre brought international attention and support, it also lit a new flame under the South African police who looked to blame others. This meant new bans on anyone that spoke against the government and supported resistant groups such as the ANC and Communist Party, both of which Ruth was a member of. Following the Sharpeville massacre, South Africa was in a state of emergency, while the rest of the world was locked in the Cold War. Because the U.S. was more concerned with catching communists than helping the victims of apartheid, needless to say, the South Africans weren't pleased, but they continued to push back against the government. Ruth continued to write, despite many bans, treason trials, and exiles, about all of the issues within South Africa, as well as Mozambique, where she spent many years in exile. As time went on, the South African government became more irritated with Ruth's persistent opposition and scared her and her daughters into moving into Mozambique. She was forced to give up her public life and work from home in quiet positions within Mozambique. She also had to leave her beloved Spark newspaper. While Ruth didn't exactly silence herself like the threats against her from the South African police intended, Ruth became more involved in education for all than the anti-apartheid movement. Because Ruth was still regarded as one of the life givers to the movement, and Joe continued his work in South Africa with the ANC, Ruth's time in Mozambique and on Earth was cut short. On August 17, 1982, Ruth was assassinated by the South African police via a parcel bomb that was shipped to her at her job, Eduardo Mondlane University. While she may not have seen it with her own eyes, her friend and comrade, Nelson Mandela, would become the first black and democratic president of South Africa in 1994. Mandela, like many, was eager to honor Ruth first for her bravery and sacrifice. Ruth is remembered in many ways, ranging from stamps to scholarships that fund young, eager scholars like she was. There's also a mural in Soweto, South Africa that highlights the good and beauty that Ruth brought to South Africa during such an ugly time.